When you look at the world, the first thing you see is that the world is becoming modern. And this is what the war is really all about. The best way to explain modernity is actually to go back into history. Sometimes you have to see where you were, where you are now, to see where you're going. So just for a moment, let's press the rewind button. We'll go back to Europe at the end of the 17th century, 1690, 1695, sometime around there. Life was terrible. Lifespan was very short, mid-40s in most places. Most people were half starved most of the time. When they prayed, they prayed that when the next famine came, at least some of their children might survive. That's what you prayed for. That's how bad it was. People were illiterate, uneducated. Women weren't allowed to be educated. Travel was uncommon. Most people spent their entire lives within 20 miles of where they'd been born. You had no say in how you were governed. You're a peasant, you're a serf, you just shut up and did what you were told. And nothing changed. Tomorrow was the same as yesterday. The way you plowed the field, that's how your grandfather did it, that's how your grandson would do it. If you were the woman of the house, the way you washed clothes, prepared meals, that's how your grandmother did it, that's how your granddaughter would do it. Life was static. The modern world is very different. Lifespan's nearly 80. Incomes vary widely, bother some people. There's no starvation. For the first time in history, we have a society, the modern world, there's no starvation. That's never happened before. Do you realize what an extraordinary human accomplishment that is? And it's happened within our lifetimes. It's so extraordinary that today we are told accurately the biggest health problem faced by poor people is obesity. Isn't that stunning? It's actually happened. People are educated, literate. Women are educated. They own businesses. They run for political office. Travel is very common. We have a huge say in how we're governed. We don't always like the outcome of elections, but we have a big say in it. And nothing stays the same. The technical word for the kind of change we live with is industrial productivity. From the moment someone comes along and says, you know, there's a better way to do that, everything changes. Somebody starts a business. They develop new products, new services. There's a whole industry doing it. Someone has a second idea, now there's a second industry, a third industry, and a fourth. Five, 10, 30 years later, someone comes along with an even better idea, completely changes that first industry. Then it happens to the second industry, and the third, and on and on. It's like an escalator that never actually stops. Like with any piece of machinery, from time to time it breaks down. And if that escalator breaks down and you don't have a good firm grip, well, you can get hurt. And then it picks up again and it goes. That's us, that's the modern world, that's how we live. Our transition to the modern world wasn't smooth and seamless. The 18th and 19th centuries were violent. In our own country, we had a civil war, we killed 700,000 of each other. The 20th century was ghastly. World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Bosnia, fascism, communism. Look what it took to get us here when you look at the war, when you look at all the turmoil in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Egypt, Syria, all the rest, what you're looking at is the entire Islamic world beginning to make the journey we began more than 300 years ago. And what we keep saying to these people is, can't you guys do this by next Thursday? No, they can't. Look what it took us. There's a very specific reason it's going to take them a while. And that's the nature of Islam itself. When you study history, it's the story of competing operating systems. Our operating system is Western civilization. This is who we are. Western civilization started in the ancient world, took off in Europe in the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries. When Judaism and Christianity reconciled with the modern world, the rabbis, the priests, the scholars, they figured it out, they paved the way forward. That triggered the scientific revolution itself. It ignited the greatest explosion of art, literature, and music the world's ever known. Shakespeare, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Bach. When you stand back from it, here's what Western civilization is. The individual is at the center of it. Church and state are separate. It's the rule of law, the idea of property rights, economic liberty, individual rights, human rights, women's rights. In Western civilization, we unleash the entrepreneurial talents of our people. We encourage intellectual curiosity. 
It's an endless struggle for equality among the races and the sexes. Islam is a different operating system. In Islam, church and state are combined. They don't have that separation the way we do. Islam is a political structure as well as a faith. It's both, and the individual is subservient to that church-state combination. You do not have the option to opt out. Islam does not unleash the entrepreneurial talents of its people, and it discourages intellectual curiosity. That's why there hasn't been a scientific breakthrough from the Islamic world in a thousand years. And this is one of the tragedies of history. The Muslims are geniuses. They invented algebra. It's an Arabic word, algebra. They virtually invented the science of medicine. In every field of science and technology, they led the entire world, and then everything stopped. There's no other example in history of that happening. But if you spend a thousand years crushing intellectual curiosity and slaughtering your geniuses, you don't get new technology, you don't get new science. The great tragedy is we have no way of knowing what the human race might have known by now if they hadn't have done that. There's one other feature of that operating system that's relevant. All too often, it treats women as though they were property rather than people. Very simply put, that operating system is incompatible with the modern world, and that's the glitch. What we're looking at now, when we look at all the turmoil in the Mideast and around that part of the world, is a billion and a half people beginning to write the code for version 2.0, beginning to figure out how to reconcile the principles of their faith, which are marvelous, with the modern world as we did centuries ago. That's what this is all about. We're living through one of the great moments in world history. The entire Islamic world is on its way to becoming modern. And remember, they only just started. In one of the oddities of history, we know the precise moment the Islamic world stepped on the road to modernity, and it was 9-11. There's an old rule in geopolitics. It's OK to hit the Americans. It's sort of fun. Never hit the Americans so hard they feel it. Then they kill you. Japan discovered that in 1941. When they hit us at Pearl Harbor, every intelligent fascist in the world said, what to do that for? The war was going great. Now the Americans are going to get into it. And we did, and with our allies, we destroyed fascism. Well, fast forward to 9-11. When the trade towers came down, when the Pentagon was hit, every intelligent radical Islamo fascist in the world said, What'd you do that for? Now the Americans are going to send their armies out. We did. It's been 11, 12 years. We can spend all day, all night arguing about what we've done, how we did it, should we have gone into Iraq, should we have done it differently. I'm one of the 310 million Americans Bush didn't ask either. Wish he had. Not defending anything. Here's where we are after all these years. In Afghanistan, the Taliban's gone, bin Laden's dead. In Iraq, Saddam Hussein's gone. Iraq is actually a functioning democracy. It's very fragile. The first functioning democracy ever in the Arab world. You do realize our troops won the war. It was an extraordinary victory, and they're just not getting the credit. They won the war. Okay? In Tunisia, Ali is gone. In Libya, Gaddafi's gone. In Egypt, Mubarak's gone. Syria, Assad's on the ropes. Do you see the pattern? This isn't what bin Laden wanted. When he hit us on 9-11, he was trying to lock down the Islamic world into the seventh century, blew it apart. He made the classic mistake, he hit the Americans too hard. Is it going smoothly? No. We making mistakes? Of course. Wars are a mess. They always look like you're losing. And by the way, when you study the history of wars like our Civil War, World War II, the heaviest casualties are in the six months before the other guy surrenders. It always gets worse before it gets better. And so don't be discouraged. These things take a long time. And that's just the way wars are. And I'll give you a way to look at this. Uh, remember Occupy Wall Street? A couple of years ago, all of our cities, probably here too, had big demonstrations, went on for a while. Some of them got pretty nasty. If you were watching that on television, say in Tehran, you would have said the United States is on the verge of revolution. No, it wasn't. What you don't see on television are tens of millions of us getting up in the morning, dropping the kids off at school, heading for the office, and saying, gee, I wish these idiots would get out of the way. But American goes to work isn't a Fox News alert. 
It's like airplane lands on time. They don't break into the news to tell you that. It's only when something goes wrong. What you don't see on the news, understandably, are tens of millions of people in the Islamic world getting up in the morning, getting the kids off to school, and saying things like, gee, I'd rather have a Starbucks on the corner than a car bomb. Wouldn't it be great if Ikea or Walmart came into the neighborhood instead of another crazy lunatic mosque? Now, you don't see that kind of thing on TV, but that's what's happening. Don't be discouraged. We're living through one of the greatest moments in world history. The world is becoming modern. And that's what's happening. And as the world becomes modern, now we can see the second very big thing happening. Not only is the world becoming modern, the world's becoming rich, fast. Never in history have so many human beings emerged so swiftly from poverty. Here are the numbers. By 1980 or 1990, about 2 billion human beings had crossed the line out of poverty. Since then, about another half billion have emerged from poverty. A lot of them in China and India. In the last six years, about 20 million Brazilians have crossed the line out of poverty. Today, on the continent of Africa, the number of people with disposable income is over 300 million. When you put all the numbers together, here's what you've got. Each year, between 50 million and 100 million human beings are crossing the line out of poverty. The low estimate is 50 million a year. The high estimate is 100 million a year, somewhere in there. With numbers that big, you can't be too precise. I think it's been closer to the higher end. But let's be conservative. With the global recession, let's drop it. So every year, 50, 60, 65, 70, 72 million human beings are crossing the line out of poverty. Now, when we say someone's out of poverty, we don't mean they have a big house with a swimming pool in the backyard and two SUVs in the driveway. To be out of poverty means there's enough food to eat. You're living decently, not in a house as nice as yours or mine, but you're living decently. The children have been inoculated against the basic childhood illnesses, as yours have been, as mine were. They're getting up in the morning, they're off to school, having breakfast. At least one of the parents has some kind of work that's putting some disposable money in their pocket. Not as much as you've got in your pocket or I've got in my pocket, but some work that's putting money in their pocket. That's what it means to be out of poverty. And today, more people are reaching that point than ever before in history. If this trend continues, and in fact it's accelerating, if it just continues, it means that within your lifetimes, within the lifetimes of more than half of you sitting here this morning, the world will cross a line that's never been crossed before and that most economists never dreamed could be approached. For the first time in history, the overwhelming majority of human beings will not be poor. Isn't that stunning? That do you realize most of us here today will live to see this? If we don't, our children will. And by the way, our kids are not being told this is in front of them. We're telling them the world's getting worse and worse, and it isn't. It's getting better and better. Our children, kids in high school, I passed on the way out here, they will live in a world in which for the first time in history, the overwhelming majority of people are not poor.